Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Amrita Singh. I'm one of the psychologists at the Mailman Siegel Center. I work specifically in the Developmental Assessment Clinic where we do evaluations to determine whether children are displaying features of autism or if they're experiencing any developmental delays. Um, I'm also here with Dr. Annie Morrow, who's one of our great postdoctoral residents, and we will be talking to you today about the different evidence-based treatments for autism spectrum disorder. Um, and discussing how you can determine the effectiveness of these programs. So we're gonna talk about some different um, aspects of evidence-based treatments. Specifically, we're gonna discuss the National Standards Project, which is a really great resource that parents and caregivers should know about and determine um, which uh, treatments are evidence-based. We're going to discuss some of the important aspects that you should consider when you're looking for a treatment for your child. Um, and we're going to talk about the different factors that a family would need to consider for setting goals and for evaluating their therapist's effectiveness. Um, at the end, we're also going to touch on some resources that you can use, okay? All right, so usually when we're talking about evidence-based treatment, we can get very overwhelmed by what's actually effective versus what's being marketed in the community. So often and individuals will just go online and they're gonna search because they're trying to find what's um, going to be most helpful for their children. Unfortunately, there's a ton of information out there, so it's really hard for us to parse it apart. Um, so Dr. Morrow is gonna give you some more information about how you can do that. All right, um, so right now, normally we, if it weren't a recorded webinar, we would ask you to take a minute and just think, you know, you could close your eyes. What have you heard so far? And just to keep that in mind, and then I'm gonna give you a little bit more information. Um, as I talk about this concern, as Dr. Singh has already mentioned, when we're looking for treatments that really work, um, evidence-based treatments for autism, there are so many factors to consider and resources are really limited. You know, you only have so many hours in a day, so much time, and money doesn't grow on trees. There's also the energy that it takes um, to really put forth your best effort, um, to bring your child to different therapies. And so we're gonna try to think about how can we maximize all of these um, all of the positives of treatments and still think about, okay, well, what are the limits um, surrounding this area? And as I mentioned a, a little bit, um, and as well as Dr. Singh, we're gonna focus specifically on evidence-based treatments for autism. That means treatments that have research behind them. And so much of the information that we're going to discuss today comes from the National Standards Project, which really takes a lot of research into a account and compiles a lot of information. And this project came out, uh, the second phase of it in 2015. And there's a third phase that's currently ongoing, uh, set to come out at some point in 2020. So this is an ongoing expert-based review of a lot of the research and the science on what really works for autism. So um, I'm, I have this slide here just to really drive home that point about you know, how the, how the um, National Standards Project takes into account evidence. And so they have some descriptions um, here. Oh, one second. Um, and so they, and what we mean by science and what, me, what we mean by research, um, I'm gonna give you a, a little image, a little illustration to explain. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. And um, so what you can see here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but if there's a group of children that's in this first circle here, a scientific study works, not every time, but many times, by dividing the groups of children perhaps into two. And so you can see there's two groups, they're equal in size, and the way that you divide children into these groups is random, so something like flipping a coin. And for half of the children in the scientific study, they might be assigned to receive an intervention, something to help boost verbal behavior. 
And in the control group, they might be doing something that is what they had already planned to do. Treatment as usual, um, something to that effect. And so what a scientific study does is to compare the two groups and look to see, is there a significant difference between the number of children in this fictional scientific study in my image here, um, is there a significant difference in the number of children that speak at least two words? So you can see in this um, pretend version of a science, scientific study, there's four children that learned at least two words or more in the treatment group, which is twice as many as the two children in the control group. So I think what this image is trying to convey in sort of a visual format is that people that design scientific studies, you know, they take their time, they observe what happens, and they try to measure things and hold things constant, hold things to be the same, um, and make a comparison to the best of their abilities between someone that's receiving a treatment versus someone that isn't. So I'm gonna go to the next slide. And what this image shows is that there are so many scientific studies that are out there. Um, and to me, I look at this and I'm like, whoa, this is in information overload. Um, so I think you know what, what the purpose of the National Standard Project is, is taking not just one scientist, but a team of scientists a team of scientists with many years of expertise and a lot of training in the field of autism and having them read through all of these studies and then group them based on, you know, how much research is there for certain treatments for autism? You know, what are the findings of that research? And so I think as you can see, um, I'm gonna put up the three categories here. Uh, the National Standards Project has these three big groups of how they classify treatments for autism. So it's a range and an established treatment would mean that there are multiple groups of independent researchers that have found significant, like I was showing in that earlier image, results showing multiple groups showing this treatment really works for autism. Emerging is that there's a little bit of evidence, maybe there's one study, maybe even two studies, but they're not, there's not quite enough for enough science for the team of experts to say this treatment really works. And, and what I think is important to understand about this last group here of unestablished treatments is that there's no evidence of effectiveness that's very scientific or very systematic. Sometimes there's no evidence at all. There's not evidence that it's bad or evidence that it's good or even evidence that it's neutral. There just might be a lack of evidence. So I'm gonna go through each of these three categories and thinking of that phase two of the National Standards Projects and talk a little bit about um, some specific treatments for autism. In this first slide, I'm gonna go over there's 14 different treatments that have been identified as this established category. So that means that there's good science, sound science, that these treatments, um, they really work. And as you can see, just glancing at the slide, many of these treatments are based on behavioral principles. So there's behavioral interventions, cognitive behavioral intervention packages, a comprehensive behavioral treatment for young children, um, and many other techniques. And so what I mean by behavioral treatments oftentimes includes um, a focus on trying to understand what might be the function of a child's behavior, you know, learning what happens right before an antecedent, what happens right after a consequence, and using that sort of thinking to try to plan treatments, try to plan strategies that encourage the child to do their best. Um, so some of those um, treatments might include things like that you've heard of before, like positive reinforcement. Um, that might be something like giving a child a compliment when they've done something that you are looking to see. Um, so I'll, I'll go through and I'll talk a little bit about some of these other established treatments. So there's language training. Um, sometimes that's delivered by behavioral health professionals and sometimes uh, language training protocols are delivered by speech and language pathologists. 
So these established treatments are not, you know, just coming from one particular provider or set of providers. This is often multidisciplinary work. Um, there's modeling where you show an example of what you want the child to do. Um, so for example, if I wanted someone to work quietly and raise their hand, I might model raising my hand. Um, and then there's natural teaching strategies where you're really working on teaching the child, um, you know, things to learn, um, different techniques in the environment that they spend a lot of time in. Sometimes even in the home, um, there are clinics um, that will send providers to, to the home. Um, and those natural environment teaching strategies, um, you know, I think one of the benefits is that if you learn it right in the environment that you want to use the skill, sometimes it can help give the kid a boost. Um, because instead of learning, you know, at a desk where they're doing certain practices or school type of work, um, they're learning how can I count, um, you know, when I'm in the kitchen and then the next time somebody is working on a recipe together or something like that, the counting that they learned was in the environment that they plan to use that skill. Uh, parent training is, is another wonderful option um, that I think it really often is a component of all of these treatments that I've been talking about. Uh, you know, I, I always say there's, I think there's 168 hours in a week um, and children spend the most of that time often with a parent or a caregiver. So a lot of uh, really uh, effective treatments for autism involve surrounding the child by adults that are on the same page and that are using the same strategies. Um, and another really helpful resource could be using peers in the child's environment to help implement interventions. For example, um, in certain cases, a classmate. Uh, pivotal response training is very similar to natural teaching strategies. Um, and schedules, sometimes visual schedules, might be really helpful to teach independence or to give a child structure. Um, scripting often involves uh, teaching a certain social interaction by using a specific script. So even though all introductions don't go exactly the same, sometimes when you're getting started on how do I do a social introduction, it helps if you have a little script. You know, you might say, hi, my name is Annie. And then you might ask the other person, what's your name? Um, or if it's someone you already know, you might say, hi, how are you? So those are just a few examples. I think for older um, and, and more cognitively advanced um, individuals, sometimes self-management and really incorporating um, the individual as a collaborator in, in their treatment, um, sometimes individuals can manage themselves using some of these same strategies. Um, and social skills can involve things like role plays where you act out certain situations or teach certain social strategies. And story-based intervention can be in some ways similar to scripting, um, but sometimes it's helpful to use stories to teach new concepts. So on the next slide, now I'm switching to talk about emerging interventions for individuals under the age of 22. And as I, you know, show this list, I'm going to leave this up on, on the screen for a few moments here. You may see um, several different strategies. And what, what I take away from this is that maybe some of these interventions, by the time there's the new, the third phase of the National Standards Project, maybe they're, they're going to move up from the emerging intervention category to that established category. There's growing research, growing science supporting these ideas. What I, what I really wanted to comment on is that technology-based intervention is currently only in this emerging uh, evidence category. So my hope, especially during these times right now, we're recording this um, webinar during the COVID-19 pandemic, my, my sincere hope is that we move technology-based intervention, we do more science, and we increase the amount of support so that we can call that an established intervention one day. I think that's something that might be really helpful to families, you know, as we're dealing with the limitations right now, sometimes of in-person therapies. So I'm going to go to the next slide to talk a little bit about unestablished interventions um, 
for individuals under the age of, of 22. So some of these things that you see here, you know, animal assisted therapy, um, special certain diets, the gluten free diet. Um, I, I've worked with many families that were using some of these treatments that had less scientific support behind them. And that's why in the National Standards Project, we call it unestablished. So I know that there's a lot out there on the internet. You know, there are even other providers that might be um, advocating for some of these interventions. And, you know, I, I think it's, it's really, it's a difficult decision to make. And so I, this is, the National Standards Project is just one thing to consider when you're trying to select the treatment that's right for you, you know, your child and your family. Um, you know, as, as I look at, at these treatments or any of the other treatments um, that I've heard about in the past that, that really don't quite have the scientific support behind them, uh, and we have a video that goes a little bit into this, I, I really, my biggest tip is that I, I really like to encourage families um, to think about if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. Uh, as I talked about the established interventions and even some of the emerging interventions, a common theme is, is that learning anything new, whether you have autism or whether you do not have autism, often takes a lot of effort. You know, trying to change your behavior often takes a lot of effort. Um, and so I, I think, you know, sometimes uh, certain unestablished interventions will be advertised in a way where it's, it's like, works fast now, you know, everything gets better and you just drop off and go. And um, I, I've definitely seen some of that marketing out there. And, you know, it's, it's really tough to, um, to, you know, take all of this into account. Um, but, but that's my one tip, you know, about if things are too good to be true, they probably are. So I'm going to go to the next slide that has a video and I'll play the video um, that gives a little bit more information about this idea. Hi, I'm Donna Murray. I'm Vice President of Clinical Programs for Autism Speaks. And today we're going to be talking about how do I know which autism treatments are safe and effective. At Autism Speaks, we encourage families to seek out evidence-based practice, although we know that's a challenge. One evidence-based intervention that we know about is behavior therapy. It has proven to be effective across the lifespan in learning new skills, addressing communication skills, as well as social skills. In addition to behavior therapies, there are a number of supports that have also been proven to be effective. Things like using visual supports or schedules, as well as using modeling. And you can use real person modeling in real time, as well as video modeling. Challenging behaviors can be very concerning for families. One thing we really recommend is that before you start an intervention for challenging behaviors, you have a functional behavior assessment. That helps your provider understand what might be triggering those behaviors. And then you can employ some of the behavior therapies that we talked about, or if you're still, or the child is still experiencing behavior challenges, they also be combined with medication. But it's really important to work closely with your provider when coming up with a plan for challenging behaviors. Some of the work that we've been doing in the Autism Treatment Network is doing a better job of understanding some of the medical. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the video there. Um, and I'm going to go, go to the next slide. So just let me know when you want me to go to the next slide, Dr. Sure. Singh. Thank you. So the reason we shared that video is that I just think it's great because it has some really nice visuals of what some of those treatments will look like. Um, and Autism Speaks is a really great organization for families and caregivers to get a lot of resources on the treatments that are appropriate for autism. Um, <clears throat> so when we're thinking about um, a treatment approach or starting treatment, it's usually helpful to kind of get a sense of what your main goals are. So for parents, um, it's helpful for you to sort of have an idea going in of what your main concerns are and what you're hoping to accomplish. Um, so for some families, um, a goal could be reducing tantrums. Another family, it could be actually just helping their child learning some words. Um, and for another family, it might just be, hey, my child has great language skills, but they have trouble actually initiating play or doing a greeting, like putting those words together. So getting a sense of what your main goals are can be really helpful. And 
collaborating with your therapist on those goals. So often the therapist will have done some observations or met with you and they're going to also have some suggestions of goals that might be um, useful. So when working with a therapist, you wanna make sure that the goal is concise. So often <clears throat> one common mistake is just having a goal that's too general or broad. So saying that I want my child's behavior to get better or I want my child to make friends. Those are great goals, but we need it to be a little bit more specific in treatment. So it might need to be a little bit more um, concise and we'll have some examples of those later. You also want the goal to be focused on a behavior that you can actually observe and measure. So tantrums, there's so many behaviors within a tantrum that can be observed. Like you can see when the child's throwing, when they're screaming, if they're dropping to the ground, um, and you can measure the frequency, um, the duration of those tantrums. So that's a really nice example of a goal if you want to reduce tantrum behaviors. It's an area where you can actually observe it and you can measure it. And you can also identify the conditions where that behavior is occurring. So <clears throat> when working with a therapist, you might realize, well, the tantrums tend to occur during meals or perhaps it's only during transitions. And knowing that information will then help you with uh, understanding how that um, treatment is going to address that specific goal. And as you're working with the therapist, you might find that the goals change, right? Your child needs some improvements. And so now you have to modify the goals and move on to a new one. Or you realize that maybe this is too hard. This is something that we kind of have to tailor back a little bit. So you might then change the goal to something that's more appropriate. So reviewing those goals is really important. And that's something that you might find that you're having a lot of discussion over with your therapist. So these are some examples of um, target behaviors. Again, we want it to be very specific. So the first one, you want to increase your child's ability to respond when greeted by another person. <clears throat> so that's a really great goal for when you're working on social skills. Another family might find that their child's having a lot of difficulty with uh, toilet training. So perhaps their goal is to just decrease the number of accidents per day. Um, a few others, if Dr. Morrow, if you can, thank you. A few others are increasing compliance, right? But when we're talking about compliance, what are we talking about specifically to your child? So for one child, it might be, well, I want my child to comply quickly, right? Um, for another family, it might be that we want our child to comply when there's multiple steps or multiple requests. Um, for another family, it could be that they're working on some adaptive skills. So the target goal could be increasing the child's independence for dressing. Um, so when thinking about the goals, it's important to, again, collaborate with your therapist. Another important factor to consider is um, making sure that your therapist is someone that's very well trained. Um, some components of that that you'll notice are, if you just go back a slide, Dr. Morrow. Sure, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> are checking that their therapist is gathering some background information. So a therapist that's got a lot of experience and is trained, they are going to do a really great job gathering information from you, right? So they might do a really great interview. Um, they might do some observations of your child and their natural environment. Um, and that, again, is their way of getting a really comprehensive picture of your child. Um, a therapist that's also well-trained is someone that's really up-to-date on the current research and on um, any new changes to any kind of treatment programs. Um, you want a therapist that's also using a lot of data to inform decisions and not really just their opinion. It should also be informed by the data that they're gathering. Okay, so can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, it's important to feel comfortable to um, ask questions about your therapist, their certifications, if they have any license, and also, you know, is this a therapist that is working under a license or are they still working under supervision? That's all important information for you to know. So, you know, you should certainly feel comfortable asking to get that information. Um, again, the more informed you are about the providers, the more comfortable you're probably going to feel about this treatment approach. Um, so as you can see from this visual, all the different fields, they have different levels of certification or licensure that's required. So it's really great to just try to stay up to date with this or just ask these questions when you're not sure. Okay, next one. Thank you. So as we mentioned, it's important to gather information and gather data. So what you'll find is that a therapist that's um, 
providing really effective treatment, they are getting information from you continuously as you're working with them. And they might be collecting information on their own, either from doing observations or having you fill out different rating forms. So this is an example of what we mean by collecting data. <clears throat> so as you can see, prior to starting treatment, the child was having a lot of incidences of throwing, right, throwing objects or, and then when treatment started, the, the amount of time that that was happening started to decrease. So because the therapist was collecting data, you're able to actually see the progress that's being made. You're seeing that reduction in that behavior. Um, so sometimes it's really nice to have this as a visual or your therapist is just able to actually have a conversation with you about that, about those changes that have been seen from the data that's been collected. Um, another important area is making sure that you, your therapist, and your child all have really great rapport, right? So often a therapist will spend the majority of the time with the child, but they're also going to be collaborating with you, right? Providing updates to you, um, discussing goals. And so you also wanna make sure you've got some really great rapport. So having someone that you feel comfortable with, someone that's really warm and welcoming to, with your family, you'll notice that some therapists will often play games or have a lot of toys available as a way to make therapy more engaging for your child. And again, that's all part of making sure that your child feels comfortable when they're meeting with them and that they're developing that really nice bond. Um, it's also important for you as a parent to know that you're your child's best advocate. Um, the therapist is an expert in their specific field, but you are still the person that's most involved with your child. You're really the expert on your child. Um, so that's why it's, we always encourage parents to be as involved as they can because you're often the one that's going home with this information and you're going to have to carry these skills over in some way. So really we always support families in being um, participants in the treatment process as well. And part of being part of treatment, um, it will mean sometimes implementing some of the interventions. So your therapist might work with your child. Um, they might, for example, if it's behavior therapy, they might be implementing a behavior treatment plan, working on reducing tantrums or maybe increasing compliance. And once they see some progress there, they might then work with you on training you in some of those specific skills. That way, when your child leaves the office, you're able to also implement those skills and your child is getting that intervention in a consistent manner from people across their different settings. Um, so this is why it's important to always collaborate with your therapist. So some things that we have to take into consideration when we're thinking about a treatment is how um, effective is it going to be for your family? So there's a ton of research supporting a treatment plan or a program but we have to think about how can we make it individual to your family so it's effective for you. So there's some cultural variables that might need to be taken into consideration. So for example, when we're working with kids on the spectrum, one of the goals often is to improve eye contact. Um, but in some cultures, it's considered rude or disrespectful if someone's making a lot of direct eye contact. So perhaps that's not gonna be a goal that's an appropriate goal for your family. Or maybe it's a goal that you wanna modify. So sharing that information with your therapist is really important. And a therapist that's informed about different uh, areas of cultural variables is also important. Um, the family structure is something that needs to be considered as well. So if there's different caregivers in the home, we have to make sure that they're also on board with this treatment plan. Because if you're working with the therapist and you're doing a great job implementing um, interventions, but then maybe perhaps grandma, grandpa, they're uncomfortable with it or they're not sure how to do it, um, it's going to be difficult for that treatment to really be used effectively in the home. So communicating with your therapist about um, how other caregivers are feeling, including them in a session if possible, giving them updates on the intervention, that's often very helpful. Um, some other considerations are about you know, your work schedule. So being really, um, upfront at the beginning about what your schedule looks like will be helpful because then your therapist can collaborate with you and be flexible about those appointments. Um, it's really hard to manage multiple appointments for your child, right? So your child's in school, they might have speech language therapy, they might have ABA, um, maybe they have OT, so so many different um, appointments. So it's important for your therapist to also know what your work limit um, schedule looks like so that you can make sure that you're attending those appointments consistently. Um, 
Therapy can also be expensive, especially if you have to do different types of treatments at once. So considering the finances is something that you'll also have to really think about and, prior, and really come up with a plan. And again, um, speaking to your therapist about those concerns will be helpful because they might have some really great resources that they can share with you. Um, so these are some important factors, but then you know, certainly think about your own family and if there's other factors that we have not discussed that might be important for you to um, talk about with a provider. Okay, I'll turn it over to Dr. Morrow now. Sure, so I'll jump back in. We have this slide here to talk about some of the lessons that Dr. Singh and I have learned over the years about um, delivering the best care. You know, so there's the science and then there's, you know, what happens in real life. Um, and so, you know, I have a, a bullet point to start us off about how I, I think for providers, if, you know, if we're thinking on the front end about what are some things that might go wrong, I think a lot of it comes down to making assumptions about people um, or, you know, providers that don't know what they don't know. Um, so, you know, I, I often um, give this example of that I'm, I'm not the best with knowing every single language that's spoken on the continents of North and South America. Um, and some of the clients that I've worked with uh, will, will speak a language other than English or speak a language other than Spanish in their home. So I might not know exactly what it is, but I know I don't know it. So sometimes I'll just ask, what languages do you speak in your home? And it kind of, it's like a, it's a way of just acknowledging. I'm not saying, is it English? Yes or no. Is it Spanish? Yes or no. Is it Nahuatl? Yes or no. I'm just, I'm asking it openly and accepting all the answers that may come. And, you know, the, the second point that I wanted to go over of taking a, an approach of lifelong learning, I think really um, follows that open-ended question. So when I ask a question openly and, you know, the patients, the families, the children give me an answer, I remember that for the future. Um, and, you know, sometimes these bullet points are listed into the research studies and, and, and you know, sometimes they're not. Um, and one of the things that I think I've seen just be such an amazing, you know, home run, you know, you hit it out of the park success has been when there's somebody that is an insider to a certain group and that person goes out and becomes, and, you know, they have specialty training and they become an autism um, clinical provider. Uh, so I can give you a couple of examples. I have done so hard to try to learn Spanish. I've worked on this for so many years, but my Spanish is never going to be as good as someone who grew up speaking Spanish. So I think we need, you know, if there's clients that speak Spanish, we need to get as many Spanish speaking providers into the behavioral um, specialty training programs or psychology training programs, speech therapy, so on and so forth. Um, and so rather than just taking a bunch of you know, providers that already went to school for psychology and saying, okay, here's the Rosetta Stone uh, training. Uh, we're gonna learn the language after the fact. Um, and, you know, it really, it goes, I always give the language example, but it goes so far beyond language. And some of the colleagues and the mentors that I've had that just are real leaders in the field, they match the same ethnic uh, background as some of the patients that we were serving. Or, you know, I can think of a really strong leader um, that, that we know that we have a colleague who is a mother of a child with autism. So she has this unbelievable insider knowledge of that she has sat on the other side of the table while planning, you know, individual treatment, you know, for her child. And she knows, you know, what it's like to give information or to provide treatments and also, you know, what, how it feels for a family to receive them. Um, so, you know, I think as we've, you know, been going throughout this presentation, there are so many things to take into account. Um, and it's nice to start, I think, with the National Standards Project and looking at, you know, what is the science behind a treatment? Um, but then, you know, to really individualize it and think about how this fits into your life. And I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, speaking of, of individualizing and, and just thinking about how can you find uh, treatments that are out there in your community 
Um, and we have some information um, for you all. So, you know, we have the, uh, the links to, to Autism Speaks, which is a really wonderful um, web-based resource. And there are often local um, centers for autism and related disorders, the CARD centers. So we have a link here for um, the, the centers in Florida. And then early steps for children under the age of three, we have a link for, if you're watching this video from the state of Florida, for our local version. Um, but I've also seen very similar programs in other states called, you know, first steps. Um, oftentimes each state has their own program um, to, to deliver services for children under the age of three. Once children turn three, um, they're between three and five years old, there's child find. Um, and so there, there are often, um, you know, different websites and you can look it up to find your local child find. And um, so we have here um, that we mentioned Broward County, which is uh, where our center is located. And so this is, you know, a really great resource for when you're older than three, but before you get to school. And then as many of you know, the school districts, um, when you are uh, five years and older, often step in and can be a really helpful um, uh, resource for families. So I, I'm not sure, Dr. Singh, should I go to the next slide or are we, is this our last one? I think this is our last one, um, but certainly you can contact us um, if you have any questions about evidence-based treatments or you want to get some recommendations for um, providers in the community. Um, please, you know, keep in mind that we're still doing a lot of research in the field for autism. So getting any kind of new information is really great. It's great to always um, connect with those websites that we've recommended, call and connect with CARD or even contacting us so we can provide you with resources. Um, really, some of our main points here are just to make sure that your therapist or any teachers even are really well trained. They have experience working with a child on the spectrum. Um, be comfortable with asking a lot of questions, right? Um, I know sometimes it can be hard, especially when you're meeting a lot of different providers and you're not as familiar with what they're doing. But when you have those questions um, ready to go in that first appointment, it really helps us and it helps you. Um, and please don't be afraid to include friends or any advocates. So if you have a feedback appointment or perhaps a school meeting, it's great to have those um, individuals there with you that can be there as your support system. Um, so we just wanna let you know too that we're here uh, at our clinic and we're open to always answering any questions that you might have. Uh, thank you so much for watching our little webinar here and we hope it was interesting and helpful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.